Okay, so I'm in a dilemma here because I really want to talk about how major world events affect Bitcoin and what I think Bitcoin's going to do in regards to what's going on with Israel and Palestine right now with Gaza and all that. But at the same time, I don't want people to get offended or take things the wrong way. So maybe I should talk about Bitcoin and what it can do to Bitcoin without talking about the events. But if I do that, then it will look like I really don't care and all I care about is Bitcoin and the price of Bitcoin. So I was really contemplating if I should make this video and even now as I'm recording this video, I'm contemplating about if I should release this video. So I'm not even sure you're going to see this. But bottom line is a lot of you in the comments section or in DMs are asking me how I think this war will or how it can affect Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. So if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to make my position clear to all this just so you don't have any misunderstandings. So let's start this video about getting my opinion out the way as fast as I can about what's going on with Israel and Palestine and who I think is right and who I think is wrong. Okay, so let's start by saying that I am Greek. I am Greek and I'm Greek Orthodox. So both as a nationality, but also as a religion, I have nothing to do with what's going on in Israel and Palestine. Now, now don't get me wrong, I have studied, I have looked at history, I have an opinion of what's going on. But picture this, what you're getting right now is bias opinions if you're from Israel and bias opinions if you're from Palestine, naturally, right? I mean, if you're in one place, you see things differently and you see things in your benefit and what's good for you. If you're on the other side, same thing, vice versa. So the problem with these two countries is that their bias won't let them see further than their own solution for their own people, so to speak, at least in the majority, yes? But at the same time, the rest of us that want to give an unbiased opinion, well, we can't. We're not qualified. We're not qualified culturally and we're not qualified because we're not there. It, it doesn't affect us immediately, if you will. So there is a lack of understanding or barrier there when it comes to culture and when it comes to understanding, especially when religion gets involved, history, land, and so on. And people saying that it's a religious thing and religion is the cause of all this, they're just stupid and ignorant because this is more than just a religion situation here. Yes, religion plays part of it, but there's history of the lands that is debatable. It's not simple. If it was that simple, it would have been solved long ago. And there is so many barriers of understanding what's going on here. For example, a lot of people I see on Twitter, I see in posts saying that Palestinians should leave, they should go to Egypt and that Egypt should open their borders, not regarding what that will do to their economy. Let's say you suddenly get 2 million people coming through your borders. Do you know the logistical nightmare that would be and what that can do to your economy? And because I know there's going to be a lot of people in the comment section down below telling me that they can absorb it, they have enough money and so on. Do you realize it costs about $117,000 per year on average around the world to be able to take one refugee? Now multiply that by 2 million or how many people you think Egypt should take in. And I know a lot of you, because I saw this on Twitter, are saying that 117000 is not in Egypt because Egypt is much cheaper to have house, electricity is cheaper and so on, but, but that's not the case. You have to realize that it may be cheaper to do something, but the currency is also less. And if they print more currency, they're going to get wrecked more than a crypto investor on a Tuesday. See, imagine you have a house and you're living with a family of five. You're supporting your family. You're making enough money. You have the kids. They're going to go to school. You're buying the groceries, the food, and you have money left over. Then imagine suddenly having 500 people in that family. You suddenly can't afford food. You can't send anybody to school. Everybody's living like shit and it's just not possible. You have to be able to scale up to that. Countries can't scale 2 million refugees coming in. They're going to get overwhelmed. There'll be less jobs. People will make less money. The people won't be working. They're probably going to be robbing and rightfully so. I mean, it's the only way for them to live, whether it's right or wrong. I mean, what choice would they have? The government has to feed them, which means more tax and so on. Now consider also that your house is not big enough, so you need to build more houses, but you're not making enough money to even provide groceries. Now, if you have extra houses already available or if you're planning for expansion and you're scaling, 
that's fine, that's okay. This could actually help your economy. But right now, it doesn't. That's why Egypt is not opening their borders. So for all of those on the internet shouting, all of those of you that are shouting, oh, just take them in, just take them into another country, not that simple. And I know a lot of you are gonna say, well, Poland took in Ukrainians. Okay, yes. But the difference is Poland can actually handle it. Actually, they're spread throughout Europe because that's the way they're doing it in Europe. There's a little thing where they spread people around European countries so they can help the refugees. But also, Ukrainians, let's face it, different culture, different people. And I'm not saying they're smarter or anything like that, don't get me wrong here, but believe me, Ukrainians can get job in tech, they probably can do programming, they can probably do a lot of things that right now in Palestine, the people in Palestine, not to their fault, they can't because they never, they never, they never had that type of education, let's say. So education plays an important factor here also with how much money the refugee will be entering the country. A lot of these Ukrainians weren't broke or if they don't have money, they have assets they have the education to be able to handle things differently, to, for this situation to be a handle differently and give them more opportunities, if you will. Now, you're probably thinking to yourself, Paul, okay, I understand that. Maybe I agree, maybe I disagree, but what's your opinion? Who's at fault here? And what I like to do is always say this. There's three sides to a coin, the heads, the tails, and the edge. And you need to be able to stand on the edge and look at all three sides, including the side you are on. But in this case, we cannot stand on the edge because we cannot relate culturally or religiously or even historically because we're not there. We can have an opinion, but it's not based on factors to be able to be a valid one, if you will. So let me simplify this. Let's just say both countries are right for their own reasons. Israel wants more land, they need to control the land. Palestine wants their land back. It's debatable, it needs to be solved. And both of them are fighting for survival and well-being for them, their families and offspring. And let's not take into account who attacked first. Did Palestine attack first or the Hamas? Or did Israel attack first and was it some sort of retaliation? Let's leave that to the side. Let's say they're both right. Even if you are right, and I'll start with Palestine right here, I'll start with the Hamas. Even if you are right, when you attack civilians, when you attack people that cannot defend themselves, women, kids, and parade them the way you did and show it on TV and be proud of it, you are wrong. And, and bear with me, I know a lot of you are going to say, well, Israel kicked the shit out of us and they did that. Yeah, well, yes, okay, our police in Greece kicked the shit out of us and do that as well. And there's mistakes being made, but not to this level. When you go to war, when you're a freedom fighter, you go to war with the army and you go targeted. You do not go to civilians, you do not go, you do not go to women, you do not go to kids because that makes you a terrorist and it makes this a terrorist attack. Even if you were right, even if you're 100% right, your actions just made you wrong. So when this conflict first started, Israel was correct. Israel was correct to respond the way they responded. But here's the other problem now. And please don't get me wrong. I'm not saying Israel going on a killing spree justifies anything here. Just, just please let me try and do this as best as possible because it's hard enough as it is and I know a lot of people are going to take this out of context regardless. Bear with me, hear me out here because Israel also messed up and Israel also lost their right to be right in this case. Because if you are retaliating hard and you need to retaliate hard because you have to make an example, you can't just make peace in this case. You have to make sure that this, this will never ever happen again and no one will even think about doing this again because if you let it go, not only will you get backlash from your country, but guess what? It's going to happen again. They have no choice but to go in and wipe out Hamas. Let me, let me just clarify that. But when you cut water, electricity, food and help to the country, you're not just fighting Hamas now. Now you're fighting the people. Now you are fighting children. Now you are fighting the sick. Now you are fighting people's parents, grandparents, people in need. You are also doing the wrong thing. And even if you were right, you just lost that right. 
So here we have Palestine right now, here we have Israel, and both of them hate each other because both of them have seen their kids die in front of them, heard and seen them tortured, whether it's with bombs, whether it's lack of food, starving to death, whether it's because they can't get medis medical help and they could have lived, but they're not because of what's going on or whether they were dragged and raped through the street before killed as an example. We have two cultures here hating each other. And this does create extremists. Extremists like the Hamas. Now there is one caveat to the story that I want to talk about. The Palestinian people, do they want Hamas? Did they actually vote them in? Because yes, there was a vote, we know this. But do they all support Hamas? Do they all agree with Hamas? And look, let's be honest here, you could rally behind Hamas out of frustration because of emotions, because of seeing your kid die in front of your eyes, doesn't mean you agree with them. That emotion might take over or it may be your only choice or may seem like your only choice with, with everything that's going on right now. But what bothers me, what bothers me a lot is when I see different Twitter posts on Twitter or X or whatever you want to call it saying Greek people are siding with Jews. Lebanon is siding with Hamas. Uh, Iran is with the Palestinian people or whatever country says whatever. All these tweets I see, all these tweets and all this news articles and media saying we're siding with them or we're siding with those and so on. I didn't say that. I didn't take any position. Why are you speaking for everyone? How do you know what my opinion is in Greece as a Greek when it comes to Israel or Hamas? You're answering for me. You're talking for me. And this doesn't bother anyone? Well, I guess we're used to it and we're conditioned to it. People telling you what you should believe or just tell other people what you believe. So what's my opinion? Who do I support? Who do I think is wrong? Who am I backing? Neither. It's nothing to do with me. And when I say it's got nothing to do with me, I'm not saying that I'm ignorant or I don't care or it doesn't bother me or me seeing both sides suffering doesn't hurt me inside. What I'm saying is I can't have an opinion because I do not live there. I am not of that culture. I am not of either religion. There is a peak to my understanding of the situation. Everything is not black and white and everything is not just historical and simple. It's just not. There are other factors, other variables present. All I know is my emotions are going up and down. They are split, but a lot of people around the world, what they see is what the emotion they're going to inherit. Whether they are Israeli, whether they are Palestinian, doesn't really matter. What bothers them the most, it's going to push them to that side. But that does not make them right. We do not know. We do not know the situation. Let me give you a further example here so you can understand the emotion involved here. Someone from Palestine, I, I can't rem remember the organization, but it's pretty high up there, okay? They have a say in things, said they are horrified with what's going on and they are ready to talk peace or cease fire. And Ben Shapiro, someone I follow and respect said, fuck off. And the truth is, if this happened in Greece as a Greek, I would say the same thing. If Turkey attacked and I saw this happening in Greece, as much as I don't have anything against the Turkish people, I will have after that point. Im imagine people that have been in this conflict for years and still unsettled and people losing houses and people losing family and so on. Then you had Andrew Tate answer Ben Shapiro talking about how he's not a fighter and him as a fighter, he understands things differently and there's always talks, there's always room to talk about peace. And look, I used to fight as well. I used to fight a lot, but that has nothing to do with war. You don't see people next to you being murdered next to your eyes. But I do understand what he was trying to say. But, but sometimes Andrew is a bit over eccentric in um, his speech pattern. But he had a point. There's always room for peace. There's always rooms for talks about peace. You should not neglect it because even if you're not going to say yes, at least you're going to have some information and maybe there's a way, maybe there's some sort of miracle or something that will bring peace or at least bring a little bit more less death to certain people that are innocent and not at fault. But then at the same time, you go back to what I was saying before. If you're going to get into a fight, especially a war, you should do enough damage so they don't think or won't be capable to even attack or do this again. 
because you are talking about terrorists here. And even if they're freedom fighters, even if the Hamas are freedom fighters, their actions made them terrorists, at least in this situation, in this point of time. So it's a very difficult situation and a lot of people are giving a lot of opinions, but they're not qualified to give the opinions. So whose side am I on? Humanity, the people, the innocent people. I'm on their side, on both sides of the fence. What's going, what's going on is disgusting. And yes, this can escalate to a much larger war. I don't want to talk about it. This is not what this video was supposed to be about. As a matter of fact, I was just going to touch on the subject, but it's so complicated and so real and so recent. And it's now that I kind of like went a little bit overboard or talked about it more than what I wanted to talk about, if that makes sense. But a lot of you are here to know what this will do to Bitcoin, the price of Bitcoin and how much money you're going to make and if you should buy, if you should sell, if this is going to make a dip so you can buy much more Bitcoin so you can become a millionaire. Wars don't affect the stock markets as much as you think. I know a lot of people tell you they do, but they don't. If you look historically, you'll see usually the stock market rallies which probably means Bitcoin's going to rally. At the same time, it's considered a safe haven as gold or digital gold. A lot of people will be buying gold right now. So Bitcoin should be going up. Sure, it might go down in the short term, but generally speaking, it will be going up. So in other words, this news is irrelevant to the price of Bitcoin, at least in the long term. We're still trending up. So yes, you could safely buy Bitcoin. And yes, you might have the chance to buy Bitcoin cheaper and make more money. I mean, that's what it's about, right? Money. At the end of the day, all you care about are your bags. Most of you anyway. See you in the next video.